This is the on Google TV 4K streaming box, and this is actually the 2023 version that just came out not too long ago. This is a small revision to the original unit that came out back in 2021 and was quite a popular device given its cheap price point for a Google TV certified device. I was pretty excited when I saw that Walmart was rolling out a slightly updated version of this as I really wanted to cover it for the channel and be able to show off what a ridiculously cheap box like this can do for the money. How ridiculously cheap you might ask? Well, this unit is available for under 20 US dollars coming in at $19.88 new direct from Walmart. So in the past few days my local Walmart store finally received some of the newer ones and of course I picked one up and got to work to see what we can do with a cheapo Google TV certified box since if you know me you know that I'm much more interested in what kind of emulation and gaming we can do with a device like this. Now if you aren't familiar, On is essentially Walmart's own brand of electronics and they have all sorts of products ranging from tablets to accessories. Just like Walmart always does, the plan is to undercut their competitors, but surprisingly this is a pretty capable and decent box. Unfortunately, I don't think this one will be available for my viewers outside of the US, but hopefully you'll find this interesting to see what a piece of hardware can do for such a low price point. Now what makes this box stand out is that it is an officially certified Google TV product, unlike a lot of the questionable TV boxes that you see on Amazon and other market places. This means that the device will come with Android TV out of the box, and in this case, the on box ships with Google TV OS 12. So hang on for a moment, and let's talk about the specs quickly before we unbox this thing. This will allow us to see what's different from that first generation unit from 2021. As I mentioned, this is available for only $19.88, and because it's an on product, will only be available at Walmart stores and the Walmart website. The 2023 model comes with an Amlogic S905 Y4, with four Cortex A35 cores running at 2 GHz with a Mali G31 GPU. The S905Y4 is a slight change from the original's S905Y2, and with that change brings some support for AV1 decoding. Other than that, most of the internals are pretty similar to the original model, and this refreshed version still comes with 2GB of RAM and 8GB of internal storage. There is support for dual band 802.11ac, Wi-Fi 5, Bluetooth 4.0, and support for 4K video. Out of the box, you do get Google TV OS 12, which is the new name for Android TV. Outside of the HDMI port for video out and the micro USB port for power, the device does not provide any other additional inputs or outputs. By the way, the retail packaging for both versions are very similar, so if you do head over to your local Walmart, just double check that you are in fact receiving the newer unit. I've included a picture of the older one for comparison. Most Walmarts should no longer be selling the older model, but it's still worth being mindful of it. Okay, now we can return to the unboxing. With all the flaps out of the way, let's carefully take this out of its sleeve and continue diving into the contents. It looks like we have a lot of little compartments for all the included goodies. Let's get this first compartment out, and it looks like this is the unit itself, and wow, this is really tiny. I never did own the original, but I didn't realize just how small this device actually is. Here we've got a quick start guide for the on streaming box, nothing too fancy here, it details the contents of the box, some details about the remote and unit, and of course a quick setup guide. Alright, let me figure out where I want to go next, and sure, let's go with door number 2. Nice, I think I chose a compartment with a lot of goodies in it. Ok, so here we have that power cable that is actually hardwired into the block. This has a micro USB connection on the other end. We get two AAA batteries for the included remote control, an HDMI cable, and I have to say just thinking about the price of this unit, you could honestly just buy one of these for a little more money if you're needing an extra HDMI cable. Alright, now going into the last compartment, and I suspect this is where the remote control for the unit is. And here we go, and I've got to say, this is surprisingly pretty nice, and I do like that it is using the standardized Google TV layout, and as such, you have a lot of the expected shortcuts available on the remote. So let's get back to the box itself and check this little thing out. We will carefully pull back on the folds here, or uh, maybe not. Okay, forget it, let's just get this paper off and show off the unit. As I mentioned, this is a really compact unit measuring in at a very small 3 inch by 3 inch by about 1 inch, or approximately 75 by 75 by 20 millimeters. We have the HDMI output on one side with a reset switch and power indicator. On the opposite side, we have the micro USB for power. It's kind of a weird setup with these two being on opposite sides. Otherwise, it's a simple and clean design, it's not going to win any awards, but it's low key and has a small footprint, which for its intended purpose is not a bad thing at all. I randomly had my Nintendo DSi sitting by me when I was recording this footage, playing some Pokemon Conquest, and I decided to show it off as a size comparison. I think this gives off a really good impression at the size of this unit. 
Anyways, let's move on and quickly tear this little unit down and check out what's going on under the hood. Now I know consumers complain that the original model was prone to overheating, so I wanted to see if any improvements were made to address those concerns. Using my trusty iFixit tool, I was able to pop off the bottom cover, which are held in place by fairly secure retaining tabs. You can see that there's a metal plate on the bottom cover, which is definitely in place to help with heat distribution. Wow, take a look at that chunky thermal pad, and it's so obvious they really wanted to make sure this unit does not suffer from any overheating issues, and using the metal plates and thermal pads will really help with the thermals. The board itself is very simple, and no frills obviously given the price, I wasn't expecting a lot of complexity here. Now the board itself is held into place with three standard screws, so let's quickly get these off so we can take a peek at the other side of the board and the rest of the enclosure. With the screws off, the board is easy to get out, and wow, both sides are using those thick thermal pads, and we can see the metal plate on the other side peeking through as well. You can see that they are definitely trying to draw away as much heat as possible with those thermal pads on both sides, as well as those metal plates on each side of the enclosure. I'd say they definitely were paying attention to the complaints about the prior model. I will briefly comment and say that the build quality overall is very surprising for something at this price point. I've gotta say I'm pretty impressed. So before we move to gaming, I wanna talk about some of the issues with Google TV OS 12. Google unfortunately keeps locking down more and more of the Google TV ecosystem, moving in a very different direction of what used to make Android TV so great, which was its openness. The version of Android TV on this device actually broke a lot of functionality for many great emulators because of Google's insistence on using scoped storage and removing the native file explorer from the OS as well. What this means is that depending on the emulator, you are no longer able to navigate to file locations to point the emulator in the right direction for its directories. In fact, Google has even blocked access to Android directories such as the data and OEB folders. Thankfully, there are some workarounds to this, and by far the easiest option is using something like TV File Commander or Explore File Manager. And really, it just comes down to preference, but both of these apps can be downloaded right from the Google Store directly to the device. This will allow you to easily move files to the device from a Windows PC, Mac, or even an Android or iPhone using a web browser. So once you have this opened, all you need to do is go over to the option that says PC File Transfer and turn it on. Once you've done that, you can head back over to your web browser of choice. In my case, I am using Brave on my Windows PC, and you can see that by typing in the IP address provided by File Commander, we can now access the internal directory of the OnBox. This is a great way to add ROMs quickly over your network. Now, the device has a limited amount of internal storage, and so we will definitely want to make use of external storage when looking at things like PS1, Dreamcast, and PlayStation Portable emulation. Now, thankfully, adding external storage is quite easy, and as long as you have an OTG adapter like this one here, which does a solid job adding three USB-A ports and even an Ethernet port to this device. Now, you can add external storage as long as it is formatted to FAT32. The OnBox will then automatically detect it. This is another great way to add your ROM files easily to this device by simply copying it over from a computer to your USB drive. Unfortunately, because Google insists on breaking Google TV functionality, a lot of emulators can't actually point to your external drive anymore. But I've done a lot of testing on my end to get this all sorted out and figured out so you can turn your $19 box into a surprisingly capable little emulation box. So after lots of testing with different versions and different emulators, I've settled on this setup to get the best performance out of this little device. So let's first talk about RetroArch. You will definitely want to use the 32-bit version of RetroArch since this device is not compatible with 64-bit apps. I have the APK that I'm using down below in the description box as well as other APKs that I'm using to achieve similar results. Anyways, you can sideload the RetroArch APK by either copying it over to your on device over the network with something like TV File Commander, or adding it to your USB and using TV File Commander to navigate to the APK and install it. Now, RetroArch will allow us to cover most of the consoles that the device is capable of. I am not the biggest fan of RetroArch, but because of the horrible limitations imposed by Google and the fact that scope storage has broken so many of the emulators that otherwise would work properly on this device, RetroArch is a solution that will allow us to navigate to the external storage and run games off there, saving our precious internal storage for other things. So RetroArch will handle pretty much everything except for Nintendo 64 and PlayStation Portable. The cores for both N64 and PSP are really not great, and they do work much better as a standalone. The other consoles such as Dreamcast and PS1 thankfully do work well on here since their standalone emulators are unable to point to external storage. And of course, everything below Dreamcast and PS1 will obviously have no issues with RetroArch. So let's talk about N64 emulation with Mubin64. 
I am actually using whatever version is available directly from the Google Store. Unfortunately, through all of my testing using tons of different versions and other emulators, there doesn't seem to be a way to get any of these to point to your N64 files off an external drive. Ultimately, I decided that it wasn't worth the headache, and N64 would be essentially the only games that I would need to be stored on the internal storage, which luckily do not take up much room at all, and so I decided this was an acceptable solution. Using RetroArch is just not an option here as N64 emulation really suffered versus using a standalone emulator. So for N64 emulation, I definitely recommend using a standalone emulator and loading your games off the internal storage. There's not much to set up here, I simply created a folder called N64 on my internal storage, which I created using File TV Commander and then copied over ROMs over my network using the browser method with File TV Commander. The games are very small and so it copies over very quickly. Other than that, I didn't really need to mess with settings all that much, and a lot of games run quite well, and actually much better than any of the RetroArch cores. Okay, one more emulator and console to discuss before we get into our gameplay showcase. PPSSPP is another emulator that suffered from scope storage, and if you download the latest version from the Google Store, you will definitely not be able to point to the external storage. This workaround solution should work for any other Google TV OS 12 device, such as the Chromecast with Google TV. So let's quickly take a look at PPSSPP Gold that I downloaded from the Google Store. On first launch, everything seems like it would be good to go. Ideally, you want the first option, which is to create or choose a PSP folder, which as you can see, would allow for easy USB access. The issue is that when you select this option, you can see the little prompt on the bottom that says you don't have an app that can do this. The problem is there isn't actually anything that can do this. Google has removed the native file explorer from Google TV, so we can't actually navigate to any folders to point PBSSPP in the right direction. So moving forward with the next option, which is to skip this process. Once we are on PPSSPP main screen, the same issue yet again applies here. You can't simply hit on browse to then navigate to your external storage. Now one final area to check is under system where we can change the default PSP memory stick location and once again as you can see, it's bringing up the same option that we were provided with when we first launched PPSSPP Gold. So understanding the problem now, what is the solution for this? So, like the other consoles, I did a lot of testing and found that using older versions of the emulator allows you to trick Google TV into giving us access to the external storage because the older apps were designed for an older version of Android TV and therefore require legacy permissions. And so by allowing access to the drive, we can then run all of our PSP games off that external drive, which is definitely something we want to do given the size of some of these games. So using the APK I have provided down in the description box, and once siloed and installed, the first prompt you will see is to allow PPSSPP access to photos, media, and files on your device. This is something that the version off the Play Store does not do, and only older versions of PPSSPP will do because of its legacy support. Now on the main screen, you can see that the folder is storage forward slash emulated forward slash zero which is actually the internal storage on this device. And the same issue exists here where we can't simply navigate up to the external drive and then search for our games that way. However, I found a little trick to get PPSSPP to point to the external drive by using the PSP memory card location under system and settings. Now you might remember that this didn't work in the current build of PPSSPP. But surprisingly, in this older build, we are able to type in a storage location manually so now we need to figure out the identifier used for our external storage. I found the easiest way to do this was using RetroArch and heading to import content and then heading into the first option which is scan directory. And you should get a listing similar to this. The external storage is identified by the system with eight numbers and letters. So scrolling down and you can see that my USB storage is 17FA-0849. Now you will have a different set of numbers and letters here. So we need to make note of this to either write it down or take a picture of the name of your storage device as we will head back into PPSSPP and manually type in the name of the USB storage. So back in PPSSPP, under settings and then system, head down to the option that says change memory stick folder. Here is where we will manually type in the path of our external drive. Just make sure to enter it slowly and carefully. It's very difficult to see the text here since it's dark text on a dark background. You're gonna type in forward slash storage forward slash your eight character identifier. Now in my case, it was 17FA-0849. After that, put a forward slash and PSP so we can create a PSP folder to store our games in. I'll pause for a second so you can see the complete path. Make sure to click OK, and then you will receive this prompt to create the PSP folder that does not exist yet. 
click yes and now back on the main screen you can see that PPSSPP is now pointing to our external storage as can be seen here. Now you can eject your external storage and easily copy your games over to that PSP folder that was created. Okay, time to showcase what this little device can do. For all of my testing, I am using a few different Bluetooth controllers including a DualSense, which is a great option because of the trackpad that allows you to use it as a mouse pointer. I've also tested the 8-bit Doe SN30 Pro and an Xbox Series controller, and these all work great because this device has Bluetooth support. So as I mentioned, RetroArch is perfect for 16-bit era games, and so let's start with a little bit of Genesis on here. First up is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Hyperstone Heist, which is an awesome version of the arcade-style Turtles action we love from this era. I feel like this version isn't talked about that much, which is a shame because it's a killer Genesis game and well worth playing through. And of course, I can't show off Genesis without a bit of Sonic the Hedgehog 3, and please excuse my absolutely trash skills at this game. For whatever reason, I am terrible at the Genesis era Sonic games, but absolutely love the character, art, graphics, and music. Go figure. As you can see, blast processing is in full effect here, and Sonic is running as fast as he's supposed to. Finally, one last awesome game from the Genesis, here is Streets of Rage 3, which is just a solid beat-em-up style game. It's nice to be able to showcase one of the Genesis Streets of Rage games, as opposed to the more recent Streets of Rage 4, which has been seen a lot on my channel. And it's another game running great here, and obviously, this device has no issues with Genesis. Moving on to Super Nintendo, let's start things off with the fast-paced Mode 7 futuristic racing game F-Zero which is a good demonstration game as it's got some cool scaling effects going on here. As you can see, F-Zero has no issues on here and looks and feels great on this device. Here's another Mode 7 racing game and one of the most iconic games of the Super Nintendo era and the start of this incredibly popular franchise. Here is Mario Kart and just like F-Zero, is running great and is such a blast to play. Finally, let's test out a heavier game with some Yoshi's Island, and for once, I'm not using Yoshi's Island as my battery test game, and instead I get to feature it here with some solid gameplay. And this $19 box is doing the game justice, and it runs great. So let's hop a generation over and check out some PlayStation 1. And once again, I'm sticking to RetroArch since the standalone EPSXE does not allow me to use my external storage. We'll start light with a shmup I've featured before, and this is Thunder Force 5, and as you can tell, the PS1 core for RetroArch is having no issues handling emulation. PS1 overall should be very solid on this box, and it's just insane to think that a box that costs this much is capable of doing so much. Next up is one of my favorite racing games, and one that I have definitely featured before. Crash Team Racing is a great kart style racing game from the brilliant minds and Naughty Dog, and this one is running smooth, fast, and as always, an absolute blast to play. And finally, a game that is often used as the benchmark for PS1 emulation, here is a bit of Tekken 3, and again this one is locked at 60 frames per second, and I've had no issues throughout multiple fights. So it's pretty clear that PS1 emulation is quite solid on here. Let's move on over to Nintendo 64, which if you are familiar with emulation, is definitely a lot trickier to get working properly compared to the PlayStation 1. As I mentioned, I decided to use the standalone Lupin 64 straight from the Google Store since I will be loading my games off the internal storage. Emulation with RetroArch is nowhere near as good as the standalone, and so I definitely recommend playing N64 this way. And no better way to start off than with some Super Mario 64, which is a game that I hold very close to my heart and still have so many fond memories of to this day. It's also a game I've returned to countless times and it's always enjoyable to play through again. As you can see, Mario 64 is running pretty well here. Now I've been on a bit of a cruising kick lately, so here is some cruising world, and outside of a brief slowdown at the beginning of a race, this one holds up quite well and is mostly a smooth experience.
finally hands down one of my favorite racing games on the console, and I'm still blown away by those water physics. Wave Race 64 is another that runs as intended, just like it did on the original console. And again, just an absolute treat to see her playing on a device that costs only $19. So let's talk about Dreamcast emulation, which on the higher end will definitely struggle on this little box. Games like Dead or Alive 2 is the upper limit of what's possible for Dreamcast emulation, but thankfully most of the other games run quite well, and there's plenty to choose from here. I do wish I could get some of these standalone Dreamcast emulators to work properly with external storage, but the Flycast core in RetroArch is quite good, and so I don't think we're losing out on too much here. Let's start light with some Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and surprisingly, I'm not going to do any D-pad testing here. Instead, we're just going to show off some gameplay footage of it running, and you can see that it is running nicely. Next is a game I love to feature because it's so unique both for its gameplay and awesome visuals. This is a Japanese Dreamcast exclusive, and Cosmic Smash is looking pretty awesome here. Finally, we have to show off some Soul Calibur, which is one of the best games from Dreamcast, and this is just a smooth 60 frames per second throughout. And one last console that can be emulated, and definitely the limit of what this device can handle. However, surprisingly, PSP emulation is still quite good here, and obviously much more demanding games will either need some tweaks or frame skipping, but again the PSP library is massive and there's certainly plenty that runs quite well. And using my method to get external storage working, we can use the standalone PPSSPP emulator and get as much performance as we can out of this. So let's start with one of my favorite racing games, here's Ridge Racer, and for the most part this one runs quite well with some occasional hiccups, but it's still very impressive to see it running here at 2 times native resolution on a $19 piece of hardware. And here's some Daxter, which is one of the easier to run games on PPSSPP, but I love showing this one because it always looks so great, especially when you start to scale that resolution up, and this is running at 2 times native resolution, and again with just a few minor hiccups, this one is running quite well. Finally, testing the absolute max that this piece of hardware can handle, I decided to run God of War Chains of Olympus, and here we have it at native resolution with the 30 frames per second cheat, and honestly, I can't believe it's running as it is here. You can tell that it's definitely the limit of what this $19 box can handle, but again, this is absolutely insane to see, and really amazing that this is what we're getting today from a device this cheap. Now I will quickly say that because this is running on the Google TV OS, we obviously have access to most of the streaming services such as Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, and all the other countless options, including the ability to play games off the Play Store. Unfortunately, just like its counterpart on Android OS for phones and tablets, it's almost impossible finding anything of value and worthwhile in this interface. I don't understand why to this day Google has still not figured out how to properly curate their library of content. Now this device has access to quite a number of games thanks to that Android support, but almost anyone who buys one of these will probably never know that. So I am a subscriber to the Play Pass, and you can see that a number of games from that service are available here to download. So let's quickly test the game that I've downloaded directly from the Play Store. Again, outside of pure chance, you almost won't know that some of these games exist for this device. So here's Rush Rally 2, and this one will automatically scale to the device and runs quite well on this $19 box with its full controller support. And if you are willing, you can even go as far as sideloading your APKs, so plenty of games that don't show up as supported on here will most likely still work. I tried out an older delisted game, and you can see that Cinemora is running pretty well here, and this definitely opens up another potential area for gaming. And finally, another great use for a device like this is to use it as a streaming box for gaming such as PS5, Xbox, and of course from your local PC. So first let's test some PS5 local streaming using the PS Play app with God of War Ragnarok, and this experience is really good. My PS5 is hardwired to Ethernet, 
but right now I have the on using wireless and it works very well. Now, if you want to have an even better and more stable connection, you can use an OTG adapter like the one I have here and go with ethernet to have a fully hardwired solution. However, I wanted to test wireless on this box as I suspect that most will have it set up this way. And as you can see by the footage, the experience is very solid. Now testing some streaming from my local desktop PC, here is Moonlight and one of my go-to testing games is Guilty Gear Strive since it has a lot of movement and all sorts of effects happening on stream. Similar to the PS Play streaming, Moonlight with Sunshine works incredibly well and if you've seen some of my other videos talking about game streaming, you will know how much I champion Moonlight as it is such a great solution that works really well. I don't know what it is, but I'm always drawn to cheap and underpowered technology. I love seeing what we can do with tech on the lower end, and I really had a lot of fun messing around with this little unit. For the asking price, it's an absolute steal just as a simple 4K media streamer for viewing content such as Netflix and Hulu. But with a little effort, you can do even more with it, and that really makes us even more interesting for its price point. These are so cheap, and it allows you to essentially add a compact and understated emulation box in every room of your house. In addition, being able to stream from your console or PC, and suddenly it's like having a PS5 or your PC anywhere you go for not a lot of investment. In fact, I will be replacing my Chromecast with Google TV with this device since it's actually a slightly better performer, and now that I have it configured the way I like, it will make for a neat little box. One thing I hope to look into is one of the readily available front ends and see if I can get any of them to work with the mess that is Google TV OS 12. But I really wanted to get this video out, and so that will have to be a project for another day. I'm hoping that some of the information in this video will be helpful for those that are determined and willing to turn this $19 box into something more. I think based on what we've seen, it's quite evident that it can definitely be pushed to do more than it's intended. So what do you think about this on 4K streaming box? Were you surprised by the performance and capabilities? Will you be considering one for your home at its price point? Let me know down in the comments and I hope to return with more videos on other random and cheap tech that can be utilized in different ways. Please let me know if you enjoy seeing this kind of content on the channel. And as always, I am the Retro Tech Dad, and thank you so much for watching.